you would have come across the term cpu cache when buying a laptop or a mobile after checking ram storage and display qualities cpu cache would be at the top of the secondary factors you would have chosen the device with the bigger cpu cache so this is correct the bigger is always better but that is not true every time in this video we are going to see what are the things you should consider regarding cpu cache and how it is going to affect your performance this video contains three parts first we are going to see what is a cpu cache and how it is implemented and why it is so costly and so small second where the cpu cache is actually used and how it is going to benefit the performance third we are going to see different characteristics of the cpu cache and how it is going to impact the performance of the workload cpu cache is nothing but a type of ram ram has two types one is static ram the other is dynamic ram usually the cpu cache is implemented by static ram and the normal ddr the normal ram is implemented with dynamic ram you should understand the difference between static ram and dynamic ram to know more about cpu cache then only we can say why the cpu cache is so big and so expensive this is the one bit implementation of a static ram it means to store either 1 or 0 just one bit you need this big circuit as you are seeing six transistors to store the one bit and it needs a constant power supply at this place to keep the data intact because of this the static ram is going to take so much space in the chip real estate it requires a constant power supply and the power supply is going to power five transistors in parallel so it is going to be so much power hungry on the other hand this is the typical dynamic ram implementation it is implemented with a single transistor and a single capacitor presence of electricity in the capacitor is going to determine whether it is zero or one but there are many drawbacks here because it is implemented with a capacitor a reading is going to deplete the capacitor so every read in dram is going to follow up with the right and as the capacitor is very small it is going to leak very faster this also requires constant recharge of this dynamic ram because of these factors this dynamic ram is going to be very slow but as it is implemented just with one transistor and a capacitor it is going to occupy very small space so dram is going to be very small and cheap this is second part of the video in this section we are going to see where exactly the cpu cache is coming in the system architecture and how it works this is a typical system architecture there is going to be multiple loads of cache between the cpu core and the main memory these caches are named based on the level they are set usually instruction cache and data cache are separate whenever the cpu wants to work on any data which is residing in the main memory it will be first transferred from the main memory to the l3 cache from there it will be transferred to the l2 cache from there it will go to the l1 cache and then the actual operation will be performed on the data one thing you should remember here is further they are the cache is going to be slower and bigger how does the cache is going to improve the performance as you know the cache is going to be much faster than the main memory so for a cpu instead of working on a data which is residing in the main memory if it's working on a data which is residing in the l1 cache it is going to be much faster but anyway to load the data from the main memory to the l1 cache we have to access the main memory in that case there is no speed advantage so for the first time access we are not going to see any performance gain but the subsequent access of the same data is going to give way better performance also when a data is being loaded into the l1 cache not only the data also some data which is next to that particular data is loaded into the cache in that case if the next instruction is going to work on the next data that data is already residing in the l1 cache so this time we don't need any memory access this is called preloading the data till now we were talking about these caches are giving performance improvement but we didn't discuss how much gain we are going to get out of these caches on the left side you can see a table having a comparison for a typical cpu here the time measurement is happening in the unit called cycles cycles is nothing but 
how long the CPU is taking to perform one operation. For example, if a typical CPU takes 2 nanoseconds to perform an addition, for that CPU, the cycle time is 2 nanoseconds. You can see the access time for L1D cache is 3 cycles. It means for the CPU to perform an addition on a data which is residing on L1 cache, it is going to take 4 cycles. It means to access the data, it is going to take 3 cycles and to perform the addition operation, it is going to take additional 1 cycle, total 4 cycles. Suppose if the data is residing in the main memory but not in the cache. In that sense, the CPU needs to wait for 240 cycles for the data to reach the CPU. So overall, the CPU is going to take 241 cycles to perform the operation. By this number, you can see the difference. So if the data is present in L1 cache instead of main memory, you are going to get 80 times performance improvement. This is third and final section of this video. In this section, we are going to see how the performance is impacted by coding style. To benchmark the performance improvement, let's take a program which is going to traverse a linked list and each node in the linked list is going to be in the type struct L. Struct L is having two members, one is a pointer to itself, another is an long integer array. So as you can see, the size of the struct L is going to be varying in multiples of 8 bytes in a 64-bit machine. For non-C programmers, you can consider the struct as an object whose size is going to vary in multiples of 8. So we are going to see the performance implications by varying the size of the structure and by varying the length of the linked list. This is the benchmark graph after we have executed the code with different end pad size and different data set size. Just remember, this benchmark suit has been executed on a machine which is having 16 KB of L1 data cache and 1 MB of L2 cache. Let's just consider the purple graph with a triangle. The end pad size for this graph is 31. In that case, the struct length is going to be 256 bytes. When you see the graph, as long as the data set is less than 16 KB, which is at this point 2 power 14, the access time for each member is in single digit cycles. Because the entire data set is less than 16 KB, the whole data set can reside in the L1 cache itself. In that case, whenever the CPU wants to go to a new member, that data is already there in L1 cache. As you know, the access time for the L1 cache is in single digit, the data access time is going to be very low. But the moment when the data set goes beyond the L1 cache size, every new member the CPU is going to hit is not going to present in the L1 cache. In that case, the data has to be fetched from the L2 cache. The time required to access every new member is going to be around 25 cycles because every time when a new member is going to be accessed, a already present member in the L1 cache will be moved into the L2 cache and in that gap, new data will be filled from the L2 cache. So overall, this time is going to take somewhere around 20 to 30 cycles. But when the data set size goes beyond 1 MB, which is at this point, the data set cannot reside in L2 cache anymore. So every time when the CPU wants to access a new member, the data has to be fetched from the main memory. And the main memory is going to be very slow. This time, every new member access is going to take somewhere close to 350 cycles. As you can see, by choosing the right data set size and the right member size, you can increase the performance into multifold. So far, we have learned what is a cache and how it is improving the performance and how a right way of program is going to give better performance 
over a wrong way of program but there are still more if you learn all those things you can use that knowledge when you're writing a code to make it better if you want to know those details please post that in the comment i will make second part for this video thank you for watching this video please subscribe to our channel to learn more about systems and linux